Welcome, everybody. Good evening, good afternoon. I am Devanuj Tasgupta, um, Assistant Professor of Feminist Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. I am board co-chair with Shante Smith Cruz for the Center for Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender, and Queer Studies, CLAGS. Um, as I said, I'm Debanuj, D-E-B-A-N-U-J, Debanuj Tasgupta. Um, today, I'm wearing a lime yellow shirt. I identify as they, them, she, he, both. I'm very thrilled to welcome all of you to today's conversation, Queer Then and Now. We bring together in this set of panels, and today is the first of the two. We bring together our Kessler Award winners. The Kessler Award is one of the endowed award um, of the Center for Lesbian Gay Studies, Queer Trans Studies, CLAGS. And we bring together three amazing scholar activists in a conversation about that reflect on LGBTQ activism and, and scholarship. So I am the board chair for CLAGS and CLAGS for over 30 to 35 years has been bringing cutting edge LGBTQ research, queer trans activism by POC scholars and queer trans history. Um, this is a dynamic space. It's the first university-based LGBT tank in the country. And it's a dynamic space where activists, academics, artists working in the field of LGBTQ studies, queer and trans studies come together. And then there is an dynamic exchange and a creation of new kind of queer trans scholarship. Um, as a board co-chair, I want to make a quick plug. I wanted to say as an undocumented queer immigrant activist, when I was living in New York for um, over 10, 15 years, CLAGS was the space for me, gave a place for me to be in conversation with academics, with artists, with public intellectuals and honored my activism, upholded my activism, and really helped find my voice. And I think today I am an academic because I was able to interact with the dynamic set of people through CLAGS. So our work, I wanted to quickly say about our work. Um, our work is based on three pillars, public programming. For over 35 years, we have sponsored several key conferences that have gone on to produce field shaping books, such as the very recent After Gay Marriage, um, or in my field, the Queer Globalizations Conference. Um, we also do, in throughout every semester, programming that is free the, in the Triborough area and in the, the tri-state area. Um, we do scholarships and awards to support CUNY grads and undergrads, as well as queer trans scholars in the country. And we have several scholarships and awards. Not all of them are endowed as the Kessler Award. Hence, I'm going to make a plug for fundraising. And our third very important and newly developing area of work is to advocate for queer and trans students within the CUNY system and for queer and trans scholars within the CUNY system. So these three pillars of our work needs your support. And as I say this, I wanted to remind that for 35 years, we have been doing this. So my goal for today is that we can raise $3,500 and you will see the donate clags button. It's on the top of our page. If you can go and donate $35, $300, $500, or even $3,500, we can meet our goal. 
This will help us um, doing cutting edge scholarship, but also to support scholarships such as the Silvia Rivera um, Trans Studies Scholarship or undergraduate student scholarships, which is very important since CUNY is one of the world's largest public you know, metropolitan based university systems in the country. And for over 35 years, we've been holding a space for queer and trans studies in a public university system that serves majority students of color, immigrants, first generation students. So I hope you will enjoy today's conversation, which is very important given our times and that you will donate to CLAGS as the button is in your chat. And with that, I wanted to say that I am speaking from Calcutta, which is in India, the first capital of British colonialists. So I sit on a settler occupied, occupied country. I am one of the settler colonialists or I'm ancestors of uh, my ancestors were settler colonialists that have displaced uh, native and indigenous communities of, um, of the region. And I will now turn it to Professor Shante Paradigm Smalls, Associate Professor of English at St. John's College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, also CLAG's board member and a previous CLAG scholarship winner. So Shante will be moderating today's panel and thank you for joining us. I wanted to also um, acknowledge that today's event is co-sponsored by the Feminist Futures Initiative at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and the Department of Feminist Studies at UCSB. I wanted to thank the board, the staff, CUNY staff who have been working behind the scenes, uh, my two board members with whom I've been conceiving this event for a very long time, Professor Marco Vase and Professor um, Joseph Donica, our um, grad assistant, Jordan Victorian, and our undergrad assistant, Oriana Ullman, and our closed captioner, Beth Fraser. So with that, I turn it on to Shante Smalls. Thank you so much, David Nuge, and greetings, everyone. My name is Shante Paradigm Smalls. So thank you all for joining us, um, either live here on Zoom or uh, via Facebook or watching the recording. Um, I just want to thank uh, Deva Nuj and our other co-chair, Shanta, not me, um, Shanta uh, Smith-Cruz for inviting me to moderate. And thank you for everyone who um, is supporting this uh, before and during and after the event. And particularly, I want to thank our panelists. Um, I think what we're going to do is um, instead of me going through everyone's bio, um, someone is, Margot is going to place the um, biographic information for our three panelists in the and myself in the chat. So I just want to give you a brief um, uh, rundown. We're going to have the each panelist uh, first starting with Dean Spade with a Amber Halabau and then with Arushi Vaid starting for about eight minutes um, to answer a question I'm going to ask. Uh, then we'll have a bit of uh, discussion um, around two questions and then in about an hour uh, we will, um, David News will come back on, say a few words, and then we will go to a Q&A. So please, um, if you're watching either on Zoom or Facebook, please drop your questions in the appropriate chat. And um, we won't be able to get to everyone's questions, but we will try to answer as many questions as possible. Um, so with that, I'd like to ask the panelists to, um, if they would turn on their um, cameras. We can hold off on the microphones for now. Um, uh, thank you. So Dean Spade, Amber Halabau, Arushi Vaid, really excited. So I'll start off with asking um, the first question uh, and maybe we could also, or someone could put the questions in the chat. Um, if someone has access to that. Um, so the question is uh, first, uh, and I believe Dean will go first. Um, the first question is really, thinking uh, past, present and future um, about the histories and the current state of queer and trans activism. Um, thinking about the nuances and the contours of that activism in and around and outside of New York City from 
about 2000 to the present. Um, it's intersect, and what are the intersections with queer and trans scholarship that either you've done or advocacy that you've done or read or participated in and the institution of CLAGS. And finally, what you see as um, pressing issues maybe that are uh, still lingering from uh, 20 or so years ago uh, to the present and going forward. Does that make sense, Dean? Does that make sense, Amber? Amber says, great, so thank you, Dean. Thanks so much. Um... Yeah, I'm so grateful for this panel. I was so excited <laughs> this is happening. Thank you to all the people who organized it. Um, you know, it's like a chance to even just be part of anything in, with CLAGS is so important to me. CLAGS programming has had such an immense influence on me since I was like, maybe like 19. Um, and far, like when I was not at all related to academia, CLAGS events were always deeply community events where we were all talking and thinking about ideas and about the movement um not like not tied to academic institutions necessarily and so just like that kind of public scholarship is so rare and universities are so like you know often locked behind paywalls of various kinds it's just like deeply meaningful to me i think many of the most influential critical ideas that i first encountered were through clags or people like urvishi and amber who i met um around that same time and who we were like visiting these clags events together and um so yeah i was when i was preparing i was just thinking about this, uh, this, I was thinking about Urvishi and Amber when I met them, in, which was the mid 90s um, in New York City, and what that time was like. Um, I was thinking about how the main thing that influenced that time for me was that Rudy Giuliani was mayor of New York City. And I, um, I was feminist and queer and interested in, um, you know, being political. And I was in the middle of being torn between going and trying to like do internships and volunteer at places like Lambda Legal and Glad. And then also like I was working at a different light bookstore and at the bar Meow Mix, even though like I wasn't even 21 because back then in New York, they didn't even ID about anything. Uh, it was just very different deregulated time in some ways compared to the lockdown that occurred because of the Giuliani administration. But I, I was encountering like a community of people in the sex trades, people who had been part of AIDS activism for a long time who were not doing that through um, nonprofits who were mainly doing that through um, unpaid grassroots volunteer based groups, a lot of whom had been in ACT UP, but also people who hadn't been and um, and who were part of like widespread coalitions against Giuliani that ranged from like trying to address the way that Giuliani's police and fire squads were attacking queer bars like where I worked um, to defending street vendors to opposing more cameras in parks and more policing of public sex. As part of preparing, I went back and read Amber's essay in the book, Policing Public Sex, which was like the coolest book possible to me at that time. It's a really good book. Um, and Amber has got this great essay in it that's got a title about like lesbian fisting that I really recommend. Um, but so I was in this period where I could see this emerging kind of like pro-marriage, pro-police, pro-military gay politics. And then I was part of also these groups of people who were like against that. Um, and I was learning from people like Amber and Urvashi who had long been pushing a racial and economic justice agenda against this kind of like narrow white gay rights agenda that was so insufficient for the times we were already living in then. And a lot of, um, yeah, there was a lot of really exciting work happening along those lines. Um, and that kind of tension <laughs> really became like the general general theme of a lot of the work of the rest of my life, right? Like this, the existence of these really distinct two threads of queer and trans liberation work, one of which um, really was embracing the systems and institutions that are responsible for the most violence and was seeking to become part of them. Like, could we have gay cops and could we serve in the military? Um, and one that was part of long lineages against white supremacy, colonialism, um, patriarchy and capitalism. And, um, and then so much of my life has been about trying to articulate and name those distinctions and encourage people to even know that a left <laughs> queer politics exists because as the years passed, the conservative agenda, the conservative gay rights agenda, which sometimes also is a lesbian or trans rights agenda, you know, sometimes um, became increasingly corporate backed and the only visible one. And so most people had only encountered that 
um, that politics and that was supposed to be what we were all for. And we were like, no, no, we're for like housing for all and healthcare for all and the end of war. Um, and, and, I, and especially during that time period, I was also encountering, encountering critical race theory for the first time. And I was also encountering the idea of prison and police and border abolition for the first time. So all of those things were making this soup for me that allowed me to see how um, a queer and trans abolitionist politics that rejects the limits of like a civil rights framework that doesn't deliver material transformation for our communities. And so that's basically what I've been doing for 25 years since then. <laughs> like that kind of like was the recipe. Um, and as, as things in, in many ways just got more intense, right? Um, you know, as we saw that conservative um, gay and lesbian rights and sometimes trans rights politics become um, more endorsed by corporations. We saw, you know, the NYPD's got rainbow cop cars they drive around nowadays on Pride, or we can see like the intense pinkwashing strategy of the state of Israel um, or pinkwashing of the US military. Like we, like this, this, they only got more sophisticated with that set of what I would consider like illusions and masquerades that cover the brutal violence of those institutions. Um, so we've had a lot to stand up against. And during these 25 years, we've also seen like the pitched increase in the crises facing us today, um, climate crisis, these ongoing endless brutal wars and US military imperialism around the world um, and the brutality of se sexual violence inside the military. All of this is just peak, you know, the peak has increased. The wealth divide that's specifically gendered and racialized and the extreme growth of the criminal punishment system as the supposed solution to everything in our lives and the increasing growth of immigration enforcement. So like the crises we were worried about then are still with us, but actually they're a lot more scary even. Um, and we've seen the growing movements that push back on that. Um, the climate justice movement. I was thinking about like the Occupy moment that really sort of named um, the um, the wealth divide in a way that was not, had not like that idea had not mainstreamed before. And then um, that mainstreamed it, um, you know, the um, movement to abolish ICE. Oh, there's so many um, um, movements that are, that have the, obviously the abolition movement that are like so much more visible now than they were at that time. Uh, I think also like I lived through the mainstreaming of things I wouldn't have known would mainstream, like the trans tipping point. Like I would, I would never have known in 2002 when I was starting SRLP that we were going to have like a bunch of like trans celebrities and that trans people were going to be in TV shows and all the limits of that, right? Because mainstreaming always is about presenting like the digestible, palatable version of our communities. And it's about people feeling like the problem's been resolved when it hasn't. Um, it's rarely about actually changing the conditions on the ground for super vulnerable people in those communities. And we've seen the mainstreaming of criminal justice reform, which I didn't know was gonna happen in my lifetime. Like nobody wanted to talk about people who were in prisons, um, you know, in the early 2000s um, in, in philanthropy, et cetera. But now we've got all of these kind of horrible limited reforms that are being proposed from elites whether that's our legislatures in our states or um, or think tanks. So we see like just like version, we didn't know what would be picked up from the kind of radical work we were doing. And we also didn't don't know like how that's gonna become like twisted as it gets picked up by elites. Um, so yeah, I just, I'll, I'll come to like the where I think we are now. I think that we're facing these crisis, crises. They're really intense. Like I, the level of heartbreak and terror I have about people right now in Texas who don't have water. Um, and so many other crises that people are facing that our loved ones in prison facing COVID, so many things um, that are right on the surface right now, all the people sleeping outside. Um, you know, for me, that has really pushed me. And I think particularly like the, for the last four years, like the Trump presidency pushed me to want to further popularize the idea of mutual aid. So that's what my recent, my recent book is about. And a lot of what I've been talking about publicly, like we need to on the ground support each other's survival right now because the answer is not coming from elites. And I think that is even more important right now when we're facing a Biden administration that in every way is indicating that it is committed to the oil and gas industry, to ongoing US imperialist warfare. And then they're pinkwashing it. They're like, but look, we're gonna appoint one trans person to something or we're gonna appoint a gay person to something. Like this, it's so important now as always for our communities to say not in our name. That is not what we stand for. We are not satisfied by that. What we uh, refuse um, this kind of shallow politics of representation that has been consistently offered to us by the 
by the Clinton administration, the Obama administration, um, and certainly by the Biden administration, and 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 just really living with the reality. I'm going to stop shortly, but the, really living with the reality of of the immensity of the crises we're facing and the the kind of you know I think a lot about the movement slogan we're all we've got and we're all we need like the real task now is to mobilize more and more and more of us both to get at the root causes of the things we're facing and to support each other to survive while we do um so that's I think that's kind of like how I see the current moment and so much of what queer and trans people have always been good at from and all of our different moments of so many crises is just taking care of each other thanks Thank you so much, Dean. Um, Amber, same same set of, of questions and reflections. Uh, I think I want to start by saying that I think the moment that we find ourselves in is really terrifying. Uh, I think that it's a time of extraordinary approval of a kind of violence that was always in place, but not considered normative. So Proud Boys and Oath Keepers and Militia have been around for longer than I can name, but their ability to have uh, be seen as credible voices that represent any part of this country is to me a really frightening and um, terrifying kind of um, politics that I think is very difficult to confront directly and stay alive. Um, Dean and Irvishi and myself come out of different earlier moments of political activism that was often very complicated to be who we were in those times um, because we were poor, queer, working class, of color, trans, it was complicated in those earlier moments to find any words to represent the kinds of politics that I think we had. Though one of the things that was different is that there was an assumption that LGBTQ politics was radical, not mainstream. Um, and there was an enormous tension between the radical voices that were fighting to hold on to something that was more um, embedded in radical social change than just simply wanting to have a place at the table, regardless of what the table looked like. And earlier, times, I think, in the queer movement or in the lesbian and gay movement, it was, as it was called, um, it was always assumed that you had a radical vision, that you were going to take on capitalism, that ca that wasn't against a queer identity. You weren't balancing one against the other. One of the things that I think is very difficult now is what you were talking about, Dean, is that people can find a very narrow, normative kind of understanding of LGBTQ um, people and movements, gay pride and a television show, but no understanding of a deeper and richer kind of analysis embedded in Black Lives Matter and radical climate change and disability work and all the rest of the kinds of movements that we're a part of. I think that to me, one of the things that's the most disturbing from when I was coming out and was trying to think about queerness 
in the context of being a Marxist is that from that time on, it mattered to me that the movement have class politics, that it talk about the difference that existed between us and that we could talk about the economics of queerness, of the difference between being a homeless queer person and going to a fancy gay resort um, and having plenty of money when you got back from that vacation. Um, and so I think the politics of class has been an endless struggle to keep in place and to say there's a dynamic that needs to be talked about in terms of economic justice that's a queer issue and that that isn't an imposition of one thing over the other. It's a vision through which to see the possibility of LGBTQ politics. It can be something embedded in that. And as well, I think the other piece that I would name is sexuality and the erotic, the extraordinary power of desire and how much in the, that how much in the beginning of the movement we were accused of only being about desire and how much in order to mainstream the movement, we were willing to give up about our sexuality or how, how explicit we were in our sexuality when we were being public people as queer people. Um, the number of times that I was told to not bring up sexuality in when I was doing a speech to a place that was considered traditional um, was kind of endless. And it wasn't simply straight places. It was often also places that were worried that it would somehow explicit, the, the question of uh, politics of desire would, um, in some way impact in a negative way, a donor base. Um, we didn't have a donor base in the beginning of the movement. We were, <laughs> we were broke and that's how everybody was. Uh, but once you had a donor base, you had class politics. Um, and so you had to understand or at least be prepared to deal with the impact of talking about desire and class. Uh, in the context of uh, normalizing homosexuality and queer politics. And it has meant, I think, that we have lost much of what's the most vibrant in queer life because we have not known how to create and embed queerness in working class and poor communities. That has not been the priority, regardless of what it might have been for any of us individually. But as a movement, we have not been able to do that. HIV and AIDS was another one of those places that cut us down at the knees um, and which we were brave enough and fearless enough to take on even in the midst of the kind of death and dying that we were confronting. Um, I feel really proud to have been a queer activist from the time I came out and moved forward uh, because I think our movement has not simply been resilient, it's been provocative and necessary. And we have not been willing to say that we would step aside or hide the importance of queerness in the context of all the other issues that confront all of us in trying to do social change. For any of us that have stayed radical and moved forward, we've been lucky enough, I feel like I've been lucky enough to see new generations of queer activism. And that has been a remarkable gift that I 
feel I helped create, but which I now feel that I, um, I see as a reflection of the possibility of our future because folks really do refuse to give up before they get what they really need. And as long as we are creating movements that engage with that, I think we're doing something that's fundamentally important. The question is to me, how do we insist that our movements have vision, have the, take on the possibility of dreaming and take on the possibility of asking for what is otherwise inconceivable as part of liberation. And I'll end it there. Thank you so much, Amber, that was beautiful. And I know some people had been saying, 20 years is not far back enough. We're gonna we're gonna continue to get deeper. We're gonna continue to get deeper as you know. Amber yes, that one let's go back. We're gonna, we're, yeah, we're gonna talk about <laughs> HIV AIDS. We're gonna talk about um, but that was just our opening, Sally. So um Urvashi, thank you. Thank you so much, Shante. And um thank you, Dean and Amber, for being for for this opportunity to continue like conversation that we've been having for decades. In, in our political work. I've learned so much from you. And I wanted to start by echoing that, what Dean said about how, um, how meaningful it is actually to be in this dialogue, in this circle. And in the larger circle of people, I've been scrolling through the attendees. And this is one of the things about CLAGS that, that I always loved <clears throat> was that who's in the room is, is as amazing as who's on stage. Always, 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 you went to a CLAGS event because you were like looking around going, oh yeah, look, there's John D'Amelio or, you know, there's Alison Bechtel or, or there's this like activist I work with at the demo last week, or there's all these people who showed up. And, um, and I love that about CLAGS and I love that about who's in this, in this people. I can't shout out to everybody I know, but so nice to see you so many people who are tuned in who could really have so much to say about everything that we're talking about as well and do and have had something to say and have taught me a lot. So I wanna acknowledge that. 35 years ago, you know, when CLAGS was founded, I was um, working on prisoners' rights at the ACLU National Prison Project, suing prisons in my day job. And in my evening job, I was, uh, volunteering with dozens of organizations in DC at the time um, and before that in Boston. And those organizations, people don't know, road work, um, you know, or Alston Brighton Greenlight Safe House Project <laughs> or Lesbians United and Non-Nuclear Action or Gay Community News or Lesbian Mobilization Force. Those were the groups that gave me a lot of grounding in um, in anti-racist, progressive, feminist, queer politics. And they, along with the work that I did in my J-O-Bs, like the job jobs, which um, was always why I went to law school was to have the possibility of having some income I could earn for the rest of my life even though I don't practice law and I haven't since I worked at the prison project, but it was a class choice uh, to, uh, for security. And, um, and I, was work, I, I left the, the uh, prison project in 86 to start working at the National Gay Task Force as it was called then. <laughs> and it became quickly the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force. And today it's the National LGBTQ Task Force. And um, I, I share that, that history because so much has happened in 35 years, so much in my life and so much in all of our lives and so much in our movement. And um, I just wanna start by appreciating CLAGS for that 35 years of incredible scholarship and support for so many students, so many activists, so many scholars. Um, so I have four thoughts or several, four or five thoughts. I don't know if they're five or four. 
to kick off uh, the conversation. Uh, and the first is has been alluded to uh, by my colleagues here, but truly the queer movement has changed dramatically from the movement that I walked into to what it is and where it is and what it's doing today. Um, it's um, it, the, the amazing positive parts of it, the change have been that it's more plural and varied than ever. It's racially and economically and gender diverse and, and you know, it's conscious of that. It is, it's, it may not act on it, but it's conscious of that. While mainstream, you know, America is like struggling with gender equity on boards, you know, we're, we're like struggling with trans inclusion in different ways and, and, and have proceeded on that a lot. But I think the biggest change in the movement has been that queer people have started and are in the leadership of multiple progressive movements. The movement is not the gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender plus, you know, intersex movement alone. It is Black Lives Matter, which was started by queer people and embraces queer people and is led across the country by queer and straight and every kind of people. It is the abolition movement, which was, you know, fully <laughs> like kicked off by a lot of queer people's leadership and is still led by a lot of queer people and, and uh, especially black BIPOC people, black indigenous people of color. It's color of change, it's groups like that, it's Mijente, it's the immigrant rights movement, it's dreamers, it's the ACLU run by a queer Latino man in very interesting ways. It's Highlander Center, a mainstream Southern institution run by Ash, who's amazing. It's, it's, you know, Planned Parenthood affiliates around the country. It's racial justice groups and reproductive justice groups. It's the two biggest labor unions, AFT and SEIU run by Dykes. Out, matter of fact, they happen to be Dykes. They're like labor leaders <laughs> for decades. And I think that's really fantastic. It's the dream that I had uh, when I was, um, a younger that, you know, cause you always knew that there was these phenomenal queer people in every movement, but they weren't able to be that. And they weren't able to lead because they were, or they didn't think they were able to lead because they were queer. So I think the movement has changed because it's expanded in this amazing way. And we used to argue about, are we the left wing of the gay movement or are we the gay wing of the left? back in the day when it was gay and left. Remember those arguments, Amber? I had them a lot with Eric Rofus, may he rest in peace and uh, rest in power. Uh, you know, and Eric would be like, well, when you get to the task force, we're trying to be the gay, the left of the gay, we're trying to build a left in the LGBTQ movement. I said, that's right. And then we would say, but we also wanna be, you know, push that left, which is so frozen and turgid to be more, you know, about racism, misogyny, and queerness, and not just, you know, white economic interests, <laughs> which the old left was, <laughs> to be honest. Um, so now I think it's not that argument anymore. We are the left. I'll claim it. And I don't think, but with, the, but with the asterisks, because we're the left, but we don't have an ideology. We have identities, we don't have ideology. So that's interesting when we talk about that. The second point I wanna make is while we have changed, so have the right-wing enemies we've faced changed. They've mainstreamed like we have. They've taken over Republican parties. They've taken, you know, the, the Michigan Quackanon Republican party, the, um, the Texas Republican Party, which remember the takeover in 1992, very conscious takeover by Ralph Reed, you know, after the um, Robertson run for president, Reed came up with the plan of sort of integrating the evangelical right into the infrastructure of the Republican Party in a formal way they had not been. And he did it. And um, very good organizing. 
And then you have the, you know, so the 70s, 80s, 90s, aughts, 10s, and 20s, if not the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s before that, have always had a right wing, you know, that has been present, the anti-communist right, the, the you know, the, like you, you can take it back and people have in our, the scholars have in our community taken it back. Um, and it's always been targeted, gay, queer people have been its targets forever from eons ago to today. But what's changed is, you know, this kind of coalescing of the right. And I learned to think about the right wing and I think obsessively about the right wing. I, I've had as my personal mission is, is, not, is no longer the um, one I had when I was 30, 30, 35 years ago when I was 22. No, was I 22? What hour was I 35 years ago? No, I was 26. <laughs> Sorry, I can't add at 27. Um, but th that my mission then was, you know, queer liberation. My mission today is defeat the right wing culturally and politically. And it has been for about the last decade and I'm doing a terrible job. But um, white nationalism is as strong as it was in the 1800s and 1900s, if not stronger. And it's enormously um, dangerous as we all see. And it derives from a really interesting contradiction that we have to grapple with that, you know, the reaction that we're facing is because we're upending traditions and old identities. We are displacing people's comfort zones and their old statuses and their old roles in society. So when they march around saying, you will not displace us, in some ways I understand what they're saying because I don't think that the same old white power should have white power. And I want it displaced, you know? And I love everybody running around trying to say, oh, you know, don't call us cancel culture. Well, actually, there's a lot of the culture I want to cancel. If you want to put it that way, I wouldn't put it that way. I would call it transform the culture. I would call it, you know, take the best and leave the rest, the culture. But if you want to say cancel, yeah, I want to cancel racism. I want to cancel bigotry. I want to cancel misogyny and violence. So bring it. You know, I, I think we're too tepid in our appeasement of these arguments and against the right, by the right. So there's a whole bunch of stuff I wanted to say about the right, time is short. But I think the enemies we've faced have changed. They are more powerful, they're mainstream, they're more sophisticated, they're using the tools we use. And, um, you know, what the Republican party figured out long ago was that the mobilization of racial resentment is more effective than the, positive, than the positive ideal of cross-racial class alliance. We've not been able to achieve cross-racial class alliance as effectively as they've been able to do the wedge thing. And, and that's our challenge, one of them. Um, and uh, okay, the third sort of thing that I wanted to put into the mix was because it's CLAGS, theory matters. I think the last 35 years have shown theory matters. Um, it, it's so dangerous that the presidents of France thinks that the most dangerous thing facing France is critical race theory and race identity politics. I don't know if you've seen that. They're like attacking that because they don't wanna deal with French racism. And, you know, because they're really invested in the idea of universalism, which theory, you know, critical theory, critical race theory, feminist theory has all debunked for decades or, or complicated, maybe not debunked. Maybe there's some values that we share. We don't call it universal, but you know, it's fascinating. So that's to me was like a real vivid example of theory matters. And then there's a negative one, which is the Q QAnon theory, <laughs> conspiracy theory matters, right? It's resonating with people. Why is it resonating with people? What is it? It tells them, theory tells us, gives us analytics, gives us ways to understand the world, gives us insights, gives us at its best, a kind of poetry. I love theory. 
um, even when I don't understand it. And I don't understand a lot of it. I really don't. I read it, I reread it. I try to pull out ideas. I pull my hair out. It's turned my hair white. But, um, but I respect it because I think what it's trying to make and uh, uh, create are frameworks and, and, and uh, stories through which we can understand history and the future and the present, right? Theory. Um, but I mean, theory to me is interesting also because of the, the concept of praxis. I'm, I live in the practice of theory. I want to experiment in the practice. And I, that's where I, I love and I live. That's it. Um, so, but theory matters and it's shown itself to matter. And I think it's an interesting question about whether queer, in what ways queer theory matters. In my book group, we're reading Poor Queer Theory by Matt Brim, which is a critique of, of queer theory from a class perspective. And I really appreciate it. And I appreciate him for that book. Um, this is giving me a lot to think about. The, the fourth point I wanted to make was uh, that disparities within the queer community really exist in huge ways. We have uneven development towards liberation. You know, disparities exist as we know on class, race, geography, gender, ability, gender identity, expression, you know, non-binary, sexuality, um, there's a lot of unevenness in how people are experiencing this moment of freedom and space. And you can't deny that we've created space. There's more space to be queer in a public way, in a family way, in a work way, in a political way than there was 50 years ago, 40 years ago. There certainly was, for me, remembering the 70s and the 80s, in which I was part of queer movement or a feminist movement that was aligned with queer movement, um, it was a different kind of space than it is today. And um, I respect that, but I think that we have uneven development, you know, when 45% of us still live in states with low to negative levels of formal legal equality, much less true freedom or equity. Um, and you know what, 20, 22 to a quarter of queer people live under in, below the poverty line. Um, you know, nine percent were unemployed before COVID, and trans, black, and rural poverty rates are much higher. Twenty-seven percent experience food insecurity in a recent study of uh, of uh, people in LA. Uh, Fifty-three percent were on food stamps. You know. Um, uh, 17% lifetime experience of homelessness, large numbers of trans adults and, and uh, even cisgender, gender queer, sexual minority adults homeless in the past, in, in the past year. Um, and on and on, the data, we still have mixed data and you know I'm a nerd about data, but, and, and we can argue about data, but I think it's valuable because <laughs> it paints a picture, it creates snapshots. The snapshots tell you uneven development, lots of work to do, local, state, national, in a different way than the movement is working on it. And then the final thing I'll share is perhaps this thing that, um, you know, oh, just want to footnote, I love Dean's work on mutual aid. The book is great, so helpful, and it really a good primer to help me and others understand how to plug in to this movement. And I think the, the mutual aid movement is like a real response to this uneven, this unequal situation that we're talking about. And it's a practice based, it's a praxis based response. It's amazing, you know, because it involves, it's really great. I, props to you. Um, I was struck by, I've always been struck by James Baldwin's uh, line in um, the essay, The Dangerous Road Before MLK and, and the, collected in The Price of the Ticket, this little line, the possibility of liberation, which is always real, is also always painful since it involves such an overhauling of all that gives us our identity. The possibility of liberation is real and painful because it involves such an overhauling of all that gives us our identity. And 
I think what I appreciate about that is that when I saw liberation as a it, it, early on in my in my activist life, I had a pretty uh, like sort of political legal definition of what that meant. And I didn't take into account that liberation required a transformation of myself enough. I learned that along the way and that it might require me giving up aspects of identity that I've really, or tradition that I really clung to, that I liked. But you know, that, that to be liberated, to be in another space uh, where you're not living in structural racist and structural sexist and structural classist minds sets requires a transformation that I don't know that I've fully made. You know, I struggle with it, but I really believe in it. I believe in liberation still. And I think that it requires something more than identity. That I, than the identity that I've so proudly developed for myself as a dyke, for example. It's a different thing that, that creates space because liberation, in my view of it, encompasses the people who hate me. The world I want will never be the world of me alone and me and my friends and comrades. It'll be full of these people who are incredibly difficult so how do I account for that? I'm so, oh, so Arisha, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but we're a bit running out of time. So I was wondering if you could just- That was my- your... Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, so this is, this is great because it moves us right into the last question I want to ask of the panelists before uh, we open up for questions. And particularly it's um, the things, some of the things you, all three of you were talking about, um, it's, uh, Audrey Lord's birthday today would have been her 87th birthday. Also, Toni Morrison would have been her 90th birthday. And I was recently watching um, Marlon Riggs's Tongues Untied, and it was making me really think about the longer relationship uh, in the sort of late uh, 20th to the early 21st century about um, the politics of, uh, sorry, the, uh, the relationship of queerness and transness to um, plague, uh, poverty, to mutual aid, uh, to uh, um, organizing on the ground. And so I'm, I'm thinking about, um, wondering what your, all your thoughts are about the links, connections or disconnections between things like um, HIV AIDS activisms, um, uh, lesbian cancer activisms and other disability um, studies uh, and, and, and COVID, right? And I think, you know, the question of COVID is, um, a really expansive because we really don't know uh, how far, how many people are gonna, uh, their status, their ability status is gonna change, their uh, economic status is gonna change um, uh, because of COVID uh, and other kinds of plagues. So I was wondering if um, you'll have comments or thoughts on some of those, the longer history of, uh, of activism and, and plague within LGBTQIA communities. It's funny, I just I'll be very quick. I, I uh, because I want to hear what um, this I was having a conversation today with uh, a cancer doctor. Um, you know, I'm, I'm dealing with cancer. And so um, uh, I said to him, I'm really struck by how there isn't activism around um, cancer in the same way that there was around HIV and around um, COVID either. And I can understand some of the reasons, but, you know, we were both reflecting on the fact that cancer, COVID express, you know, engage a larger segment of the population, but there hasn't been an uprising around the lack of access to vaccines for people, you know, with, with life-threatening illnesses and, or people with disabilities and their caregivers. It's just, or, all the uneven, uneven access. And then with cancer, which I've been contending with for many years, I've, been, I've asked myself, why am I not more engaged? I've been engaged in fits and starts. And I, I don't really have a good answer for it, except that I think, you know, in my, when, you're, when you're facing 
illness, you, your focus becomes just getting through that. And organizing takes a side seat. You're organizing yourself to get to the doctor. You're organizing your meds. Your meds. And, but then that didn't happen with HIV. We had, su I mean, that was a formative movement for me. And um, I really appreciate the scholarship and work that's coming out. Um, Sarah Schulman's book is going to be out about ACT UP New York, which is amazing based on all these interviews that she and Jim did. Anyway, so I'm curious what you think, Dean and Amber, whether you agree about the, dis the, the curious, curious difference there and why it's been so different. To me, the thing that Herb, that I think of that seems to me to be the obvious marker is that HIV was so stigmatized. And so, um, so politicized from the outside, mm -hmm. not from our own community, but from the outside. Mm -hmm. And in all the ways that there was hatred around sexuality and around, um, and around racial difference and a whole like Haitians, you know, it was like the three H's. Um, so that you couldn't, there was no ability to respond to HIV without it being a political response, even if that's not how you saw it yourself, because you were up against institutions which basically were more than willing to let you die. I don't think that's true around cancer or COVID. Then you're talking about class and race about who has access, who gets a drug, can they get, are they too old to get from their building to a vaccination site? But HIV and AIDS was just a complete set of hatreds that were mobilized and which underscored mythologies around queer people and people of color and sex workers. So you kind of got thrown in the midst of, there was no way to do this piece, but not do that piece because you had to have a collective response to have any response. And with COVID and cancer, it seems to me it's been very individualized and people live in that isolation. And while people may be a part of a community or a set of people that react, there isn't a collective political understanding of, of change in relation to illness and HIV, maybe because it also came closer to gay liberation and to also our understanding of that, it, had, it was embedded in a lot of fury around sexuality and being blamed. And I think it shifted. And, and I actually was shocked, was thinking about it today, thinking, how remarkable it was that we didn't lose the movement when HIV happened. I mean, I just assumed that everybody would go, would, would fade because they didn't want to be connected to HIV and AIDS and therefore they'd go back in the closet if they'd ever come out of it. And instead people came ra roaring out of the kinds of places that they had lived in response to it. And it was a remarkable thing. And it created an agenda like no other that was kind of framed through feminist medical kind of understanding, but, but was deeply embedded in sexuality and the refusal to give up desire. And so to me, it was really a remarkable thing. And I don't think COVID 
I mean, I think COVID has funny pieces where people are afraid that they might get it if they stand too close to you, which reminded me of all the mosquito things about HIV. If you got bit by a mosquito and the mosquito had been out in Cherry Grove, could you get HIV? Um, but, but I wonder whether there may become a real uh, angry movement because COVID is so inequitable in terms of treatment and survival. And I, so I think it may take longer, but I, I wonder whether that's really gonna happen. I don't know, Dean, what do you think? I mean, listening to you both, it's just making me think about a couple of things. Like one, the period you're talking about of like 80s and 90s, HIV AIDS activism is much closer in time to the really transformative movements of the 60s, 70s, and early 80s. Yeah. That, like, like there has been a huge backlash to all the tactics of those movements in, the, in, the, in all these years since. And as we get further and further from them, we've seen like a deeper hold of non-profitization that tells us to silo our issues. So like cancer for survivors over here, people fighting for Medicare for all over here and people fighting around climate change and pollution, which gives people cancer over here. You know, like that all, you know, people fighting around racial justice over here, like that siloing, I think is part of what aims to depoliticize things that could, that might be politicized and use a charity model of like, come here to get your services as opposed to an organizing model. You know, all of the big movements of the sixties and seventies feminist movement, black movement, Puerto Rican movement, all had like health initiatives that were like, you know, free clinics and mobile clinics. And, you know, I'm thinking about the young lords, like, you know, hijacking the the mobile x-ray unit of the, of New York city and bringing it to Puerto Rican neighborhoods when, when people needed testing. Like there was a level of militancy around healthcare that I think that early period of HIV AIDS activism um, was part of. And, and, a, and the same people were in those groups who'd been in the Young Lords and been in feminist movement and all these spaces. So I think that is like one piece of it. And, and that word you used, Amber, like individualization, like we've seen increased hyper individualization with like neoliberal culture, like just this idea that like you're responsible for whether or not you manage your healthcare plan well. And like, did you make right choices as a healthcare consumer instead of um, you know, a bigger demand, like, hey, we're all in this horrible, brutal, deadly health for profit system. And so I think there's like those pieces. I also just want to pick up on what Shante said in the question, which I think is so true. Like, I, it's been profound to see the ableism and ageism in the framing of COVID. Like, it only matters if people die. It doesn't matter if they get sick and disabled from this, you know, and it only, we only count deaths which is also what we do with police violence and it's so messed up, you know? Right. And, we, and we also, there's just been a deep idea that of course Trump was supporting, but many others that like, um, it's fine if the weak die off. I mean, it's a deeply eugenicist idea and it's, and it's very intense when black death and native death is so central in addition to old people death and people with disabilities death in COVID. And so I think there's a lot for us to do. And I do see a lot of disability justice activists um, talking a lot about that and, and helping us lift that up and helping us talk in a deep way about um, how does this relate to like Medicare for all and other efforts people are, are doing that we both want and know will be insufficient because medical systems from the government have always been racist and ableist. And you know, I think there's a lot of pieces here, but I also think that people are still just dealing with like, what does it mean to organize while doing COVID? I and mean, we've been doing a lot of organizing on a lot of fronts, but there's also still a learning curve like around how to organize um, under these conditions. And so I think there's also even more rage and more energy that we are going to see continue to like mobilize people beyond what we've even already seen. And it's been an incredibly revolutionary and disruptive time in all the best ways um, responding to what's been happening. But the economic crisis is just gonna get worse. The housing crisis is just gonna get worse. COVID's end is not actually in sight no matter what they want us to believe. That's Don't right. Other pandemics that might come after. I think this is uh, this is really great. I, I guess I want to ask, just go a little deeper into this um, before we turn to um, the uh, Q and A. We're we're gathering some questions, and again, we won't be able to get to everyone, but these are some really great questions. Um, I'm wondering as we we're talking about plague, and and many of you, many of us in the people in the chat, about these connections between things like um, AIDS, um, uh, early years of the of you know plague, right? 
Um, but I'm also wondering about the relationship between organizing um, and aging, um, particularly yeah. as um, you know, old queers or old age queers, um, um, you know, that sometimes queer culture, queer and trans culture is really focused on, on youth. Um, and I'm wondering about what you all see as, as folks evolved in multiple, right? And intersecting um, um, justice movements, liberation, um, this relationship between um, ability, disposability, uh, race, uh, class, uh, and how age begins to shift um, our value, our own, what's important to us, but also uh, our value to other, other people. Well, one of the things that I think, I, you know, let me just flag this to say the shock of losing Carmen Vasquez, um, who has been a movement leader through much of the periods that the three of us have been talking about today, is one of the pieces I think about aging, that there has been a a, a kind of revolutionary early generation of thinkers and activists, which generated things and created things like plagues, um, and we're gonna die. And it's not gonna be 25 years from now if we're lucky, it's gonna be 10 or 15 <laughs> if we're lucky and who knows whether we're still be able to do a screen. So I think that the, the aging of leadership, we've never really talked about in the ways that we should, especially in, a, in movements that have often been youth driven, but we've never talked about what the, the how we transition leadership in those movements. We don't we don't have a way to talk about how we train people and teach people. Uh, one of the things that is interesting to me about plagues is that from the beginning, it, was, it saw itself as both scholar and activist because activists were so critical to the intellectual world of queer thinking. I mean, Jonathan Ned Katz is not an academic and many of the people that have been queer thinkers haven't been scholars. So one of the things that I think is really critical to how we go forward is the question of how do we create a place for public intellectuals that can engage with the world of ideas without having to be academics. And I think that that was an early part of Clax, but I don't think we talk about it nearly enough. And yet exactly, Urvashi, what you were talking about, the importance of an intellectual, of, of thinking, of an intellectual world, of the world of ideas, of people engaging with thought that's new and different is fundamental to how you build a movement. And if we don't generate structures to create the possibility of intellectual engagement in terms of class and race and you know sex, um, we're not gonna have leaders that I think we have depended on of which Carmen, though she was, she went to college, she came out of a working class background that she never forgot. So I think those things are really critical to what kind of movement we wanna build and the issues we need to take on structurally to try and figure out how to generate the possibility of um, an intellectual life that doesn't depend on going to college. Thank you so much for that, Amber. And thank you for speaking Carmen's name. I had the pleasure of uh, working with her and knowing her when I, many, many years ago when I was a young thing at the uh, Gay Center. Um, yeah. I wanna turn to some of the questions and maybe 
uh, y'all could think about what I asked or disregard it. Um, but there was a couple, of, a few people have asked about the uh, 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 distinction or the um, the nuance that both Urvashi and Amber mentioned explicitly. And I think also, of course, Dean could speak to this about um, uh, the difference or the between uh, identity and ideology. Um, so one question was bringing up sort of marriage equality in particular, um, um, but doesn't maybe think about the spectrum of people who could uh, expanding what that can mean for people, for instance, with disability, um, with disabilities, living with disabilities and other, um, other issues. And other, um, yeah, another person asked if we could just say more about this difference between ideology and identity and how it impacts you know, queer and trans histories and, and politics. So we got a few about identity versus and uh, ideology. Um, sure. I mean, I, I, I think of ideology as like worldview or, or a f like when you think about um, it's, it's ideas and it's like ideas about what the role of government is, what the, what the nature of the economy should be. It's the role of, you know, family. It's these ideas that we um, are living in our lives, but maybe not consciously articulating as such. So we all came up in different ways, being raised or, or raising ourselves to understand the world through a certain lens. And what we're up against is a fairly cohesive ideology of the right, which is that the, you know, government should be tiny, taxes should be nil, right? Uh, the most important uh, institution is the heterosexual nuclear family. Women's role in it should be X. You know, um, it, 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 there's a whole kind of worldview that goes along with that. Now, the ideology that I was taught was a kind of a, a more textbook, like Dr. Nair, here's the red book, here's Marx, you know, and read those, and those are ideological. But I think of it in a whole different way. It's like what um, uh, Thomas Piketty's book, Capital and Ideology, really interesting, really interesting book, and actually surprisingly accessible yeah. for a reader like me who likes more, I don't know, I like, I like accessible theory. Um, inequality is neither economic nor, um, oh, what, I can't even read my writing. I was trying to pull out this little quote, but I, I'll get to it in a minute. So that's one piece of ideology. It's not, it's, it's like, it's, it's about politics. Ideology is your politics. That's how I, that's how I define it. And when I think about our identities, we have really spent a lot of time and needed to spend a lot of time articulating who we are, where we come from, what it means to us, what we stand for, what we think about, how we are in our identities in relationship to the world. And do we have a shared politics across that? What's our political view of the role of government? What is our view of how we would, if we had governing power, how would we use it? How would we deploy resources to um, people in the COVID crisis if we were in charge as queer people, like fully in charge, not just giving advice to the Biden administration? And I think those kinds of questions interest me because when you start to ask it that way, you realize, well, some of us would be libertarian. We don't want more taxes. There's a good 30% 25 to 30% of the LGBTQ vote votes Republican each time, has since the 90s, according to exit polls. Did even How that be? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like, who the hell are you? <laughs> their politics, their worldview is such that they think the economics, that's what they believe. I mean, you know that. But I so, know. Yeah, and I, I think. Um, would, would, there's, there's, there's folks who are, you know, anyway, so that's what I, I'm interested in that discussion, because I think, 
as much as I'm interested in creating spaces for and respecting and the flourishing of our identities and the plurality of who we are, that is who we are. So people live in their identities, but we will win through politics. That's what I think. Dean, Dean what do, you do you want to contribute to that before sure. I, uh, I mean, ask I the final that, question? Yeah, yeah, I, I guess, you know, I think I think it's interesting, um, Urbishi, that like you, you maybe came up at a moment where you were like, the people were reading Little Red Book and you were like, you know, like there was a certain period, I think in um, an activist onboarding moment prior to mine that was really about distinctions in, um, in like very specific factions, honestly. And then I came into politics in a moment that I was, it was totally about identity. And yet I was having the, the experience I think Amber described earlier that so many queer and trans people have where I was like, wait, the politics that's being done in my name doesn't feel like it's about me. It was 1996, they were doing welfare reform and immigration reform. I was like, all this stuff affects my own family I grew up in, I, this isn't right. And the gay or the big gay orgs that when I interned for them, they were like, we don't do that stuff. And I was like, what? So like so many people have these stories, right? And so I think part of the reason we had, we have also like an idea, the, some of the cool kinds of identity politics we have really, I learned from black lesbian critique that was like, tired of the fake universalism of particular ways that black would be claim, claimed or women would be claimed that would leave out black lesbians consistently. And so, so we've done this important work of being like, no, these identities matter in these ways, but the, the neoliberal move says, just, just have your identity and try to get represented and try to get someone like you on TV or in you know, the legislature. And then we're satisfied and don't you guys wanna become cops and don't you wanna become soldiers? And so I think that, for me, that, that period I was talking about, that anti-Giuliani period was a period of sharpening and learning the tools of like what it meant that I was an anti-capitalist, anti-racist, anti-war feminist entering queer and trans politics. And, um, and to me today, when I, you know, and I, I was just thinking about Jose Munoz and thinking about this conversation I had once in one of his classrooms about like, what is the good life? And so much of this debate is often about what we imagine. And so like the marriage debate imagined gay rich people who get to like keep their taxes together and like have each other's health care and um you know and and it didn't imagine like the kinds of queer and trans people that we've all spent our lives um fighting for and, and being and so you know i, I do want to distinguish from you and one thing obviously i know you agree with me on this but like i think both the right and the left our entire lives are the, the democrats or republicans or you know whatever they're all to the right they all have agreed actually on a giant state that's a security state right yeah. And a, and a border and, a, and yes. they're happy to have, have spend tons of government money, but yeah. just on what is the question, right? And so I think that this is all juicy. And today the, the conversation in the activist communities I'm in is often a conversation about the role of the state period. Yeah. And so people are talking about things like border and prison abolition. We're talking about abolishing the United States. Like you, you don't have a nation state if you don't have a border and prison, like that's what the nation state is, is police, is surveillance, is and that is what the contemporary nation state is. And so we're having really big debates about like, what if we didn't try to imagine the state keeping us safe, um, which in the US is a capitalist, extractive, white supremacist, colonial state. But what if we imagined what else would keep us safe? What, what is safety? What, what safety in terms of our healthcare? What safety in terms of how we care for our elders? What safety in terms of um, when interpersonal violence happens in our communities? And we're rejecting the idea that like more criminal laws will make us safer or a stronger border or um, a different way to have the state give out just to who it thinks is deserving a few crumbs. And so this is really a debate about anarchism that's very strong in the movements I'm in and in which we are a mixed group of people. Some of us are like me anarchists and some people are hoping that like a better um, social welfare state will be formed. And this is like a great conversation. We can have this conversation while we deliver water to people, <laughs> while we like yeah. build organizations. Like it's very, it's very on, it's very yeah. hands on. And so that to me is like the place where ideology is being debated right now. Thank you. We just have a few minutes. So I wanna just ask this question and, and um, thank you Dean for making me think I've been reading um, the Kambahi River Collective, which is about yes. politics that emerge from black uh, lesbian identities um, and not so, and not the sin, right? But at, what they called interlocking at that point right. in uh, 1979 um, yes. or 1977. But yeah. um, there's a question that I just, you could all just do like a pith minute, which someone asked, um, 
said that she was really inspired by what Amber said about her to be part of a movement and that this person feels really honored to um, in this uh, join a lineage of lesbian history and organizing. And so for anyone, for any of the panelists who are open to answer, the question is, do you have or remember the moment, place, sound, touch, or person that led you to understand yourself as a part of a history and a lineage? So a queer lineage, a lesbian lineage, a trans lineage. Um, and how have you held on to that memory and kept it with you? Um, you brought up the Kambahi River Collective and they were formative to me. Um, meeting Demita Frazier in 1977, who was a member of the collective who came and talked at my college, we invited her because um, we had found the, the statement in some bookstore. And um, it totally changed my life because it gave me a, a framework and, an, and, a, and a political perspective to organize from. So um, that was a transformational experience and meeting Barbara Smith, Demita in the seventies. I would go back much earlier than the movement activism that I've been a part of for 50 years, I went to a ruling class school for my last year in high school. Um, and I got in there because they needed more people from California. You know, what can I tell you? Um, anyway, I was failing. I didn't, I had never done the kind of work that was done there. I didn't know anything about an intellectual world. But my history teacher, um, I was wildly thankful for because he was a working class guy that was a teacher and talked about class. And I went to him when I was failing and said, I'm failing and I don't know why. And he said, you were never meant to be here. And then he gave me the communist manifesto. And I, and he was serious. His parents ran a hot dog stand in New London, Connecticut and were part of a communist party cell. And he said, you need to read this. And it utterly transformed my life. And it meant when I came back, when I, when I then was trying to figure out what I wanted to do, I ended up joining the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Um, and doing civil rights work. And so I think those things, you never can quite tell what it is that's gonna bring one of those moments. And yet if I hadn't gotten the Communist Manifesto in my high school senior class and been blown away, I don't know what my relationship to the left would have been or to activism. Thank you, beautiful Dean. I'll just brief, be brief. I'm just remembering right now what it was like for me to be in um, in that organization, Sex Panic, in the mid '90s, yeah, in New York City, and just like there, it was really intergenerational. And there was these older queers who would sometimes be like, "Oh, you guys, this is this thing we've been doing forever." And they would tell us history, like in the midst of just kind of talking about how to do something. Um, and it made me. I was like, it was a sense of belonging that I never had where I grew up from older people. And, and, that, and that really continued. I just wanna say like also, like when I had to go, when I was gonna to go to school, Irva, she gave me like her used computer, like literally queers have just taken <laughs> care of me. Yes. And maybe <laughs> you know, I had no parents, I had nothing, you know, and just like, it's just so amazing to think about that. And I also thought of this moment where I was arrested in Grand Central for using a bathroom in like 2002 and just like so many community people helped me like get out of jail and get the charges dropped, just like, those moments when the community catches you, and I think even the story Amber just told is that, like it's, um, it's there's this kind of trust and a belonging that is so hard to get for people who are freaks in the best ways. Oh, thank you, all three of you. Um, so we're coming to the close of our panel and I'd like to turn it over to flag board member, Margot Weiss, who's gonna give us an update on 
uh, fundraising and close us out. And thank, I just wanna thank the panelists, Dean, Arishi and Amber. That was really amazing. Th thank you for the honor of uh, sit sitting with you. Thank you. Yes, I wanna echo that thanks, give you an update that we are at $3,131. I feel like I am uh, you know, right on the like radio show. Um, so very close to our goal. If you have a little bit more in the bottom of your pocket that you can donate to CLAGS, the link is in the chat. We really appreciate this. This goes to this uh, kind of amazing uh, programming that we do to fellowships, to supporting scholars and activists um, and doing the kind of work um, that you can you can see right here. Um, what an amazing intergenerational panel of radical thinkers, radical activists. Um, such a pleasure uh, to be able to listen in tonight, hear this conversation. I want to thank the three panelists, Arvashi, Amber, and Dean, and also Shante Smalls, um, our amazing moderator tonight. Um, and also want to um, have everybody save the date. We're having a second um, Clags Kessler panel round table, um, which will be uh, Thursday, March 25th, um, 6 to 7 p.m. Histories of Queer and Trans Scholarship. Um, I think it's in the chat. A conversation with Roderick Ferguson, Jasper Puar, and Susan Stryker, moderated by Shaka McLaughlin. So you want to stay tuned for that. Um, thank you so much, everybody who has come on the webinar, on the Facebook, um, and joined us tonight. Um, have a wonderful night. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe, stay sane, stay healthy.